Good morning, everyone. My name is Sunny Sharan. Uh, I'm one of the co-chairs for the event. Uh, John, that was an awesome uh, keynote. You touched upon a lot of things, and uh, it fits right into the next panel. Uh, two things I'd like to pick upon uh, is the innovation and the collaboration you talked about. Uh, the next panel is about innovation in Southern California, innovation and collaboration in Southern uh, California. But before I go and introduce the moderate, I have to say, John's comment about homo fast food has made me a little conscious coming up on stage. So, uh, the, the next uh, panel's moderator is Sajid Ahmed. Most of you know Sajid. Uh, Sajid is the Chief Information and Innovation Officer of uh, MLK Junior Community Hospital in Southern uh, Los, Ange Los Angeles. Uh, he's leading the new hospital's $70 million uh, health information technology initiative and launching an information hub on the 42-acre MLK uh, Medical Center camp campus. Uh, Sajid was formerly the director of health IT at LA Care. Uh, before leading LA Care, um, uh, Sajid uh, created and launched eConsult in partnership with uh, LA County Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, eConsult is an innovative telehealth system that allows for virtual consultations and collaborations with specialists. This fits right in with what John said about doing the right thing than the convenient thing. Uh, so we're, we're going to uh, invite Sajid and, and uh, his panel to come on stage. Uh, along with Sajid, we have uh, Dr. Paul Gibney from uh, uh, LA County Department of Health and Human Services and uh, Richard uh, Seidman mm -hmm. from Northeast Valley Health Corporation and Peter King from uh, Kung from uh, UCLA Health System. Uh, can you please uh, come on stage? And we also have Peter Kung from UCLA Health System, who also uh, helped launch eConsult for UCLA. So first, uh, yeah, John is uh, John Matson is always I always learn something uh, when listening to John. And um, I think you know just to give you guys perspective, he took us at thirty thousand, maybe fifty thousand, down to fifteen thousand. What you're about to hear is really ground level and what has been uh, occurring with the implementation and the use of e-consult over the last couple of years, um, you're actually going to hear, and I'm very excited because I can call uh, most of these guys up here friends. Sorry, Peter, we haven't hung out much. Um, but they're mostly friends, and we were at the ground level launching this. Uh, wonderful program, technology, uh, and you're going to hear from them. So I have a couple of questions just to give you uh, a bit of um, format that I'm going to prompt them with. Uh, they're going to mention some of their uh, experiences, and then we're going to really open it up to you guys and the questions you have. And you should have a number of questions. But as a matter of background, uh, let me just say, Martin Luther King uh, Community Hospital. How many of you remember the old MLK? OK, great. Just want to make a clear distinction. Uh, with the county's help, and actually with the UC system's help, and in particular UCLA, a brand new community hospital uh, run by a private nonprofit organization is launching on the same campus location in South LA and we're very hopeful to open this brand new state-of-the-art uh, facility that will uh, be using eConsult along with uh, DHS and UCLA sometime in in the second quarter of 2015 so I just want to make that announcement uh, and do my representation I also want to give you a picture see that's what it looks like the county put uh, more than uh, $240 million into uh, renovation and construction. That's what it looks like, so I'm getting my two cents in. But more, and that's another picture. And what is very cool, uh, just to mention briefly about MLK, is it is in a public-private partnership with our friends at the Department of Health Services. Uh, so the inpatient tower is connected directly to, or right next to, uh, the outpatient center. So a lot of collaboration, a uh, lot of coordination of care, and really a new uh, place to innovate and, and test out uh, new models of care. But more specifically, and to set these guys up, I'm going to show you one graph. What you're looking at is e-consult the use of eConsult in Los Angeles County by both the Department of Health Services, represented by Dr. Paul Gibney, and also uh, Healthcare LA IPA, represented specifically by Dr. Rich Seidman, uh, of the CMO of Northeast Valley uh, Clinics. And what you can see 
is there's a big blue line. That's Department of Health Services and its clinics and its partner clinics. And that is the most current uh, update, 74,000 e-consults in the past two years. And of course, you have HCLA down here, and they're ramping up. But the one thing to note is where you see 2,000 or roughly between two and 5,000 e-consults on the orange line is when Dr. Seidman, with his leadership, mandated e-consult for not only his organization, but help facilitate the use of e-consult uh, IPA wide, and then it took off again. So I'm going to have these gentlemen, I'm going to prompt them with questions and, and brief introductions, and I think we have their slides too, to talk about their experience uh, with eConsult. I'm going to start off with a very basic question. For all three gentlemen and the organizations that they represent, why eConsult? Why do something like eConsult? And I'm going to actually, instead of me mentioning the definition of eConsult, have them mention also what eConsult means to them. And uh, I'm going to start off with Dr. Paul Gibney, and there's his bio you can read while he talks about eConsult, and then I'll. So in uh, 2011, you would look at the D, uh, DHS, uh, Department of Health Service for LA County, and it would look like a lot of other safety net um, systems across America, characterized by struggling to meet the demand for specialty care. If you look at most uh, systems, you would see, uh, you know, long waits, overmatched specialists, um, and really a system that was not responsive to care. And so one of our desires was to uh, really uh, recognize that if we were to move forward into uh, an environment like the ACA, if we were to do a better job serving our patients, that, that really responsiveness to requests for care what, what was one of our primary values. And so one of the things that eConsult did for us, it's a web-based platform that directly connects a provider who has a need for specialty assistance and the specialists themselves with no one in the middle. There's no clerk submitting it, there's no uh, nurse or reviewer, there's no uh, utilization uh, person. It's, it's a direct communication. And so we recognize that there was tremendous value when, when doctors talk and good things can happen for patients. And so we set up the system uh, to be able to invest in, in that value. And we recognized a key principle along the way, that access to specialty care does not necessarily mean a face-to-face -face visit with a specialist. In, a, in our old model of delivery, you would s think that the patient didn't get specialty care until they had submitted some sort of request that request was approved by several layers of nurses or physicians. Um, an appointment was given maybe a couple months down the line. Patient took a day off of work, two buses across town, a complicated registration process, sat in a waiting room for four to six hours, was put in the room, and then specialty care began. And we have, with eConsult, really rejected that notion. And we have said that when the specialist responds back to the PCP's question and specialty expertise is brought into the medical home, specialty care has begun. And so what we've seen in that 70,000 plus interactions we've had so far, if you had looked in 2011, in many places in our system, uh, specialty care by the old definition hadn't begun uh, sometimes for six to nine months after the original request. In over 70,000 interactions now, we still have an average response rate from the specialist in about two and a half days, calendar days, not even business days. And in specialty expertise is brought into the medical home, specialty care has begun. And so what we've seen in that 70,000 plus interactions we've had so far, if you had looked in 2011, in many places in our system, uh, specialty care by the old definition hadn't begun uh, sometimes for six to nine months after the original request. In over 70,000 interactions now, we still have an average response rate from the specialist in about two and a half days, calendar days, not even business days. And so um, we feel like we have, using this technology, um, taken that value of wanting to be responsive and created a responsive system that is probably just as responsive as, as many in the private sector. 
cool. That was one of the reasons for Hawaii Consult. And I put up the stats for DHS that you guys were looking at while speaking, and I offer the same question to uh, Dr. Seidman. This is Dr. Seidman's bio. These are all friends of mine, so all I can tell you, they're, they're awesome innovators, partners, and great leaders, and, uh, and uh, they really made it help eConsult happen. So, Rich? Thanks a lot, Saj. Good morning. Um, it's really exciting to be here today and talk with all of you and the theme of the meeting with innovation and collaboration. What these consults offered us and the, the three of us, and I'm just getting to know Peter as well, um, Dr. Gibney, Saj, and myself and many others, several years back, were having conversations about how can we collaborate across sectors to deliver, to meet a need, a clinical care need using technology. So we knew what we were trying to do, facilitate access to specialty care, improve the quality of care overall, improve patient satisfaction, primary care physician satisfaction, specialty care physician satisfaction. There had been pilots. Um, I didn't know at the time about what was going on up at UCSF with Hal Yi and, and others up there. LA Care, where Saj and I used to work together, um, we were innovating with sponsoring health information technology projects, including eConsult on a relatively small scale that was successful. And we had a conversation, wouldn't it be great? And I think this tells, tracks back to Laura's question, what do we want to do? Wouldn't it be great if we could develop a single common platform that clinics such as mine could use um, and, and organizations such as the LA County Department of Health Services, but a single common platform that would facilitate conversation, dialogue between clinicians, whether in the private safety net or in the county system, referring into both specialty networks. So the, the slide that Saj had up earlier showing the 74,000 e-consults within the DHS system and the 24,000 within Healthcare LA IPA, which is mostly private docs and community clinics. A clinic like mine feeds e-consults into both specialty networks on a single common platform. Not yet fully integrated into my EHR, but close enough and it works. I think the guys at SNC are still working on that one for you. So uh, our next uh, uh, speaker is Peter Kung. And I have to tell you, Peter Kung uh, leads telehealth for uh, the UCLA health system and he works under Molly Coy for their Innovation uh, Institute. And I'll let Peter talk about their uh, work on developing eConsult. And also, Peter, if you could mention how the UC system, in particular UCLA, is looking at the future of eConsult and their use. Great. Um, so when UCLA took a look at this space, we learned a lot of lessons from UCSF and LA Care. Um, to give you a more big picture of what, how we positioned this was, you're gonna see knockout rates and the effectiveness that Paul and Richard were just speaking about. However, taking a step back with the UCLA strategy, a lot of these problems or a lot of these initiatives that we're working on really goes into two buckets. We have our tertiary and quaternary care strategy and then our population health. Now, a lot of we're, we're working on all these different types, but what eConsult does do for that's common between this is the access issue. So when UCLA did this, where we positioned eConsult for us was for our tertiary and quaternary care strategy. Now that brings a whole different business model for us. We use eConsult and e-referral as a loss leader. We actually give it out for free. You could Google this up and it's grassroots people could get on it for free. That is a different model. That is a different model than the population health model, which it could be leveraged for as well. But the commonality between it, it is, one, you have better relationships with, say, non-UCLA clinics to co-manage your patients outside, addressing the access issue. For us, our utilization rate on average is above 100%. So we're pretty, pretty stuffed to the brim. So for uh, an, uh, and one of the benefits that you do here is finding not only a well-prepared patient, because how, how frustrating is that where your labs aren't, they're too old and you have to wait another whatever months, but also it's an appropriate patient for the specialists that we do have. And overall, what we do see a benefit is the communication, transparency between physician to physician. No, no static in between that. If they have to overbook because it's an urgency, it's done. Now, in terms of telehealth for UCLA, 
we, 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 there was a picture, I wasn't sure if we have it in the slides, but what we do see is everything from remote hospital monitoring to the live health onlines or the teledocs, all the way to getting into the home, the holy grail, and controlling those variable costs. So the UC system and UCLA, we, we see this as one of uh, a major part of our growth strategy for UCLA, um, but in particular, the e-consult, we are um, linking up with UCSF, and we're actually gonna be beginning um, integrating the e-consult system internally to our EPIC system. Awesome. So you've gotten a, a basic overview. I'm gonna ask a question that will inspire you to hopefully ask a question, and, and I'll have uh, Dr. Simon Rich answer this first. The question is, in the past year and a half of solid e-consult use um, in, in your and, and respective uh, networks, what has been uh, some of the key impacts that you see with the use of e-consult, both positive but also both critical, um, uh, such as the impact to the primary care provider, which you represent mostly, and then uh, to Dr. Gibbony next and Peter last. Rich? Yeah, thanks, Saj. Um, so one of the benefits we've already talked about is, is access and the speed with which primary care clinicians can get specialty input. So that turnaround that, that Paul talked about with a couple of days, that, that was unheard of in the previous model. Um, the, the thought of the curbside consult, that was, that was circumstance for those few fortunate enough to work in a hospital setting where you've got primary care docs and specialists roaming the hallways, stopping and talking with your buddies. That's great, it's nostalgic. You know, I kind of miss those days in a way, but that's not how most of us practice. Um, primary care clinicians were often our own primary care settings, fairly isolated from the hubs of specialty care. Now we can get specialty input to meet the clinical needs of the patient within days, sometimes within hours. Um, so it truly has transformed the way primary care clinicians can get specialty input. Oftentimes, you know, not often enough, um, but oftentimes eliminating the need for the very costly, very cumbersome face-to-face -face visit. So that's huge. Not everybody loves it. There's a huge amount of work to integrate the use of e-consult. It's a new technology. It's a new platform. It's not yet fully integrated. All of that can be overcome by those willing to take the leap and realize the benefit. So it was painful to implement e-consult, but not... Don't hold back, it. Rich. Don't hold back your feelings on it. I, I was about to, to couch that. Relative to implementing an EHR for the first time, eConsult was a piece of cake. And that's why my clinic was able to, to be one of the leaders within the IPA, because we had just gone live with our EHR. We did a big gut check and we said, can we do another IT implementation right on the heels of EHR? And we figured, what better time? You know, because people were already in change mode. It's very easy to, even though they're not fully integrated, all you do is, you know, toggle, you know, one click away, you're onto the platform, we don't have single sign-on yet, yes, that would be nice, it doesn't mean you can't use it. So we're very effective use, fully integrated. Some people, earlier adopters, they absolutely love it. You know, some of our more recently trained docs, it reminds them of being in a teaching institution. The specialists love to teach, the specialists love having meaningful, efficient, clinical interactions that help patients. And that didn't happen often enough when patients just showed up cold to specialty visits off-site. Um, one, other, one other thing just to throw out is an unintended consequence, but one we need to acknowledge and resolve over time is the reality of cost shifting from specialty care settings with payment models that support their infrastructure and what they traditionally have done, and primary care settings where our business, our business case does not necessarily bring us the revenues to support more of what was traditionally done in a specialty setting, more labs, higher cost meds, higher cost imaging. Now we're getting advice from specialists saying, hey, order these labs, try these meds, and the example I, I told Dr. Gibney and Saj I would tell in advance is 
So how about hep C treatment? Um, for those of you familiar with some of the new hepatitis C antivirals that have amazing results, they're also pretty costly. Um, 100,000 plus per case, um, sometimes can be several hundred thousand dollars with amazing cure rates, and that's a wonderful thing um, to, to reduce the, the morbidities and mortalities associated with hep C infection. Um, but the worst, the, the, my worst nightmare is, so we have a, a, we identify a case of hep C, we communicate with a, a hepatologist at the county or within our IPA network. And the IPA network, it actually works for us because the health plan pays the cost of the drugs. For our uninsured patient population that we co-manage with the specialists in the county system, if the county doc says, we'll try this drug, but that comes at our cost, we can't do that. So it's not something we thought about when the platform was developed. It's something we'll have to work out over time. Absolutely. Paul, your thoughts on impact within DHS or, or elsewhere? Yeah. The first thing that comes to mind is DHS historically, like many public health systems, was incredibly siloed. Uh, we have six major medical facilities, including MLK. We have one up in High Desert. We've got the one that everybody calls Big County, which is just a few minutes away. We've got one in Harbor, one up in Silmar. And historically, all of those systems functioned as, as true silos. Different medical record numbers for county patients between those different systems. Different electronic platforms that didn't communicate with each other. And eConsult is one system, one technology that is used the same no matter where you are in the county. And so what that required us to do was if we were going to launch cardiology services on eConsult, for the first time in the history of, of our agency, really, we got cardiologists from all the different places in our system that offer cardiology services together talking about how are we going to use a common entry point to cardiology services the same way. And so really one of the, the impacts that I wouldn't have predicted initially was just the decrease in the variability um, of the way we offer services around the system. And really the benefit that was to us as a system and ultimately to our patients. A couple of other impacts was whenever you have a system that, that almost by definition is going to have a constrained set of resources to meet the need of the population, um, the ability to use technology to leverage those resources in the most effective way possible. Um, whereas a specialist can um, maybe do two or three uh, interactions per hour in a face-to-face -face setting with all the incumbent cost of the overhead and, and the presence of the patient there, uh, many of our, our specialists, because of the efficiency built, efficiency built into e-consult, can sometimes do 10 or 12 e-consults an hour. And so using that same fixed resource of specialty care, but leveraging them over a, over a broader population it has been um, incredibly beneficial. And also the impact that when we, they have determined that a patient needs to come to see us for a face-to-face -face visit, um, being able to set up that patient for a more definitive first visit, making sure all the pre-evaluatory testing, um, everything is queued up. So um, in the old way, oftentimes that first visit was, why are you here? And, oh, you don't have all the, that we need. And so we waste the first visit to set up a definitive second visit. And eConsult allows us to use that precious visit to be more definitive in that primary interaction and make sure that it's used most, most effectively. And then pairing that to a novel scheduling process whereby we've been able to um, pay a lot better attention to the customer, reduce our no-show rates to those specialty visits. All those ways have been ways of uh, being more effective with um, our specialty care resource. Excellent. Oh, and then barriers. Um, so, Please. Yes, so, some, of the, some of the challenges and barriers. This is a completely new way of viewing the, the world as a specialist. Um, a lot of our specialists struggle with how do I um, share my expertise to a patient and to a PCP that I've never met before, I've never interacted with them before. Um, how do I frame that? How do I um, uh, bring that into um, a larger uh, institution that maybe has a teaching mission as well? 
Um, how do I rethink um, what it means to deliver specialty care? Um, and then how do I fit that in the midst of a busy day, much like the PCP is trying to fit e-consult in the midst of their busy day, our specialists always also trying to rethink and reinvent themselves um, and the way they deliver care. So that's been one of our challenges. That's amazing. And, and Peter, before you speak to, and, and I don't know if there has been much impact, but maybe to give you um, a little bit more to speak on, can you talk about uh, the initial start uh, that you were responsible for at econ uh, for eConsult at UCLA, and also how the UC system is moving towards integrating the eConsult into their EPIC systems. It's funded by the UC president, I believe, to the campuses. But what value is the UC system trying to go after, maybe more so than impact? So I, I agree that the technology in itself is pretty light. Um, and in that sense, it could be many things. The hard part is, again, where the positioning, where, where do you put that down? What's your beachhead? For us, was tertiary and quaternary care. We started off in neurosurgery, of course, right? <laughs> um, and we got patients. One of the uh, very fascinating things that we did not do at UCLA for our e-referral e-consult system was uh, we kept it open. So if you still text us, email, fax us, fine, and then we said there's going to be a small certain segment that will use this e-referral system. That was our, our positioning of it. Um, where did it go from there? Well, we now have over 39 different specialties across the board that are using it. I think one of the biggest lessons that we did do is because it could be, should it be used for internal or should it be used as a loss leader? Oh, why don't we start giving this as our population health model and people could subscribe to us and we do like a subscription service. I think getting that clear up front of what you want to do and then maneuvering your e-consult system is, is very valuable to go through that exercise. Um, what a surprising find that we did do, we opened it up to our internal physicians to use this because 150 offices around the neighborhood were expanding. So how could they use it? Actually, what we found very fascinating that led to this epic in integration was new physicians love this because they don't know the specialists. They don't have the, the, the relationships yet. And so what we're finding is if they go, I need a pathologist, where do I go? They just go on to this one system, they click pathology, and it goes wherever it needs to go, and they're directly speaking with the physician. A um, little more about our, our, our setup is under each specialty, there's two physicians and one scheduler. So if, the, if a physician's out, there's a backup, but also if there's a conversation that says, let's book this, you have the scheduler right there. Because of that, that find, that unique find of new physicians coming into the systems are physicians that may not know all the specialists. We said, well, this is going to work very well within the EPIC system. What we're also adding into it is actually filtering using UCSF templates. So if you want a urology consult, there are certain things that they go, no, co-manage, stay over there. And there are certain things that it's just gonna, you're going to come right in, but please make sure you have A, B, C ready. So the, the EPIC integration that we're going to take is a partnership with uh, UCSF, uh, uh, Dr. Neil Gleason. I hope I did that right, or he'll get mad. I, yes. Um, and, and what we're actually going to do is we're going to start, start uh, integrating the entire e-consult mod, model inside EPIC for internal. Now, where does that place e-consult that we already have? Well, we believe, well, you could have Epic Care Link and you could do these things, but it may be still outward facing to get to create the relationships to, say, a clinic that we don't have strong relationships to, and they use this e consult model. And then as we build relationships and strengthen that, maybe then we offer Epic Care Link. Awesome. So there's one last question I have, but before I ask that, I ask that question, perhaps. Uh, a brief moment to give you guys some perspective. When we first started this, and, and actually uh, Dr. Gibney and Dr. Seidman and many others, uh, uh, it w really was a collaboration. Uh, we spent many late nights, remember Paul, uh, uh, going over stuff and hashing stuff out. And with Rich too, you know, come on over. He had, he had moved from LA Care to be the CMO at Northeast Valley and we had great iterative uh, conversations. And this whole thing is about uh, what Rich mentioned, uh, and I'm glad he re uh, mentioned it again, collaboration. 
But back then, when we were building this, and you, you typed in e-consult in Google, you got some consulting firm in finance. But if you type Google right now, in, I mean, type e-consult in your Google search, you will find e-consult and e-consult LA specifically for the work that these guys have done. And another way to look at this is, you know, the sessions about innovation, collaboration, and coordinating care and population health. Well, e-consult is that first step. I call it the, the gateway software. Uh, for getting into coordination of care, um, but it's more than just a technology. So my, my last question is really, um, you know, you guys have all lived it, done it, uh, Peter's helping build it. What do you see as some future use, not just the, the technological improvement of it, uh, but the future use of e-consult, e even as incremental as maybe specialty, specialty consultation. So if you guys could speak to that, I'll, I'll start with uh, Paul uh, again at the front and then work our way down. So we are, uh, we are probably, if you looked at it overall, maybe 75 to 80% into uh, our target implementation. Um, we've got 23 specialty services up, about 1,600 PCP users um, that, are, that are submitting requests to DHS through the system. But really, our long-term goal, given um, our constraints as a system, is that every non-emergent, non-urgent request for specialty care will begin with e-consult. And we are looking at how that um, comes from uh, other specialties. When the GI doctor finds a cancer on the colonoscopy and they want to get both a, a colorectal surgeon and an oncologist involved in the case, how they um, crank that out right away using e-consult, um, how an emergency department doc who is seeing a patient who has no identifiable PCP, who is not part of any of the ACA um, products, how does that ER doc who identifies a specialty need for a patient, how do they then transition that patient uh, to the care of a specialist, but where there is no PCP to continue that iterative dialogue. Um, those are some of the directions. What do you do with advanced diagnostics? Uh, what do you, how do you um, integrate requests that can highly be supportive through uh, either decision support tools or, or through um, this kind of conversation? How do you integrate that in? And then how do you do all of this in the context where you're not just in one system. DHS didn't build eConsult just for them. We built it for folks like Rich and literally 200 other sites in LA County that are not ours. So making this outward facing, they'll never be on our EHR. They'll never have access to our EHR the way we use our EHR. They have their own. And so how do you then make this um, very available to them and ultimately continuing to lower those barriers to, you know, um, to, to difficulty of use and making it easier to use? How do, you, how do you make it more seamless? How do you make it more integrated? Um, how do you make it more effortless? Um, and, and how do you identify who these patients are out in the community? Have they been to us before? Can we identify who this person out there in the, system, in, in the community is who's, who's seeking a specialty assistance from us and have, do we know them already? Uh, things like that cool. we're, we're, we're really driving towards. Cool, Rich? Yeah, um, some great thoughts, Paul. Um, I think I'll start with health information exchange. Um, and when I first heard the e-consult referred to as an example of health information exchange, it took me a while to get it and I realized I'm in a room of information professionals. Um, but I think if you think about it, some of the examples Paul was giving is we can wait for the ultimate health information exchange solution that I think is still a little ways off. Um, or we can start where we are, and Saj called it a gateway technology or perhaps a stepping stone technology. We started eConsult to meet a, a pretty specific clinical need. Um, but from there, there's all these branch points where at the end of the day, one of the challenges is having 
the necessary information at the right time, in the right place, with the right patient and the right care providers. An e-consult does help facilitate the timing of that information at the point of care when you need it, and even remotely prior to the actual interaction with the, the, as you step up in meeting specialty needs. So if you send a patient off to a specialist who sees them and is best specialist in the world, has a great plan, not all patients are great historians, and they come back to see you in your primary care office setting, and you ask the patient, how'd it go? What'd the specialist say? And they say, I don't know. And sometimes it's not much better than that. Um, now with one of the potential uses of e-consult, and this has to be sorted out with the sponsors and the vendors and the technology, but not only can we have access to the dialogue between the originating PCP and the specialist who served as a specialty reviewer in advance of a face-to-face -face visit that ultimately may have happened, but if we can attach consult notes back onto the platform that, again, is easily accessible, as Paul said, we're never going to have, or I don't expect that we will, easy interoperability between my EHR system and Paul's EHR system and all the dozens of other systems out there. But in the e-consult process, the clinicians are picking and choosing the most essential information that we need to exchange and making it readily available on an easily accessible system so that we can get at it. So it's. It's a stepping stone that's not the ultimate solution. Um, and not, I don't believe, it precisely what eConsult was originally designed for, but it's a real opportunity to leverage it until we get to that next better solution. Absolutely. Peter? Going off what you just said, I like that gateway concept and what you just said, Richard. Um, and so two points about this is we did prove through eConsult that something that doesn't eat up the entire budget can actually spread um, and fractionalize the physician's time. That's really important because of all the initiatives really go down to the, the physician. So how do we fractionalize that time? The ultimate goal would be this, what we're working at at UCLA, is to take a specific population, whatever it is, and find a 2% uh, difference that could impact the balance sheet huge challenge that we're trying to do. Now, because of two, two big reasons. One, you, you, you could say you brought down the ED visit 10%, but w one thing's gonna happen, it doesn't show up on the balance sheet, so it goes somewhere else. Or two, something else is credited for it, right? That's what happens. So how do we find, so eConsult, what we see is a Lego piece, and what are the offerings that we put together using this concept of eConsult that we did prove it could fractionalize time, it could go out into the, the community and physicians do actually like it. Wow, that's a, that's a really good combination. But how do we put it together where now then we actually could get a 2% impact on the balance sheet? That I think is where it's gonna go. And I see very creative uses of it. Um, is anyone from Palomar here? No? If you actually go to uh, Palomar's website, you now see Mayo affiliated or we're covered by Mayo. If you actually look what's going on in there, they're offering e-consult to do medical oversight. Very, very fascinating how on a growth strategy wise, if you're gonna do affiliation partnerships, wow, something that we're discussing right here and you're going techn technologically, it's pretty straightforward, but it could make huge impacts and it's how you Lego piece these things together, I think uh, will be very creative. Cool, I'm just gonna offer one. As a patient, uh, you know, us, it'd be great if our primary care doc was when they were consult, when they're consulting, with the specialist that I also get the text exchange going, oh, that's what they're talking about. And I can be part of that exchange as a patient. I, I see that as the next level, but Rich is right. Someone has to fund it and support it. So we have about 10, 15 minutes for questions. Uh, let's pass out the mics and see if who's interested in questions. Raise your hand so that the mic people can find you. Questions? Yes, over there. Okay. Hi, um, you know, there's something um, really democratic about what you're uh, doing, the democratization of uh, healthcare with the e-consult. And so my question is, you kind of referred two or three times to um, the time in the future when 
there will be a better health information exchange solution of some kind. But um, I think what we're all seeing, those of us engaged in preparing for meaningful use, uh, stage two in 2014, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on direct. And um, I see the sort of point-to-point -point asynchronous types of connections that direct fosters as very similar to the sort of uh, democratic nature of e-consult. So I'm just sort of curious if in your thinking about e-consult you've um, uh, incorporated some ideas of how you're going to apply direct, especially since you're going to have that capability um, in your systems if you don't have it yet by the time October 1st, stage two meaningful use uh, requires it anyway. You guys want to take a stab? I can try and answer later. Will you uh, start? Well, I guess I'm taking a, thank you for the democratic process there, voting me to answer that question. Um, you know, when Direct came out, and I'll be brief, uh, it was really to address the secure messaging need that was not met through HIE or other uh, organizations um, that were providing uh, data sharing and exchange. So this is a way, Direct is a way to have that secure con uh, communication. Uh, and it's seeing value in rural clinics. Uh, Arizona has a group of clinics that use direct to communicate to the tertiary and quandary care at the major facilities, major academic and larger facilities. E-consult, um, the value there is there's a, a, a both a front end, which is that secure messaging and exchange of data, but the back end where we spent, I know Paul and I spent many nights on this one, and, and same with Rich, is you know, how do we leverage the network of specialists that are part of either the IPA, the UCLA system, or the DHS system, and have them collaborate and, and create that trust relationship uh, and dialogue with the PCPs. And so the, there's the, um, the value of the dialogue exchange to create the relationship which is unique to eConsult, but also there's the entire back end, as Paul mentioned, they, they use eConsult not just as a electronic curbside consult, they use it as part of their referral process. You've heard both both Peter and, and Rich and, and Paul interchangeably use referral and, and consult or e-consult, e-referral together. But in, in many ways, the definition of the two are, are blurring. Uh, e-consult, I, I like to say, is, is part of that intervention into the referral process, the business of referring and the clinical referring. Direct is a great uh, tool that's connecting those that can't afford it and need to still have the communication. But I think that's the best answer I can give as to your question. You guys want to something, offer? Something that I, I didn't really describe um, earlier is that uh, in DHS, we have placed a premium on the value of a relationship between the submitter and the responder. And uh, to do that, we have associated our world of submitters, those 1,600 PCPs, and we've subdivided them according to how many specialists we have doing this. And so, for example, we have 12 neurologists around the system that all do e-consult work. But each one of them is associated with a fixed group of PCPs. So I'm a PCP who works at our Hudson Clinic. Every time I want a neurology e-consult, I get the same one of those 12 neurologists. She gets to know me. I get to know her. She holds me accountable to do a good job with my presentation. I hold her accountable uh, to be a responsive specialist. And so there's, there's, a, there's a, 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 you know, a, 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 I guess you could call it a synergy between the two of us in that relationship. And that, I believe, has really been one of the um, real values of the way we've chosen to design our system. Now, certainly we had the luxury to be able to do that um, because we're not using it in a kind of a commercial sort of way, but it, it really has been very, very high value. And I, I appreciate the question. It, it, I have to say that it's not something I've thought about yet be, because we are upgrading to our, our EHR so that we're able to meet meaningful use stage two standards. It's not clear to me yet, as I sit here, how we might leverage this at some point in the future, but I think it's great food for thought, not only for folks like us up here, but also for our vendors, or what are the opportunities to help us not only do what we're trying to accomplish clinically, but also help facilitate meeting standards through another technology, not necessarily our core currently certified EHR technologies, but this is one we use integrated into our system and 
if we can figure out a way to use it to, to get credit and meet, meet a standard, that would be great. Question over here, or a couple of questions. Um, and this might tie into how do you use this. I guess my question to all of you was, have you been tracking or plan to track um, e-consults impact on your physician and patient satisfaction? It would seem to me, when you, especially at UCLA, when you're talking about tertiary care, if I'm that patient that is sitting here and now today, patient satisfaction is, I just got diagnosed with cancer, and I'm going to fill out my survey, you might not get the best result. But if you're sitting and you say, oh, here are your two doctors, your next appointment is this, and right away you've taken that. So have you thought about that impact? Are you tracking it? Is it capable? What are those next steps? And Peter, go for it. So definitely you have like the halo effect, patient satisfaction. Dr. Feinberg is very adamant at UCLA about this. Um, I'll tell you a real story. The military, we, I do a lot of work with the military. And one of the, uh, we have a base 160 miles out, Fort Irwin, um, on the way to Las Vegas. They love e-consult. Um, the reason why is each time they head out, it's gonna be either a two and a half hour or four hour trip for them. Um, and a lot of times, uh, they're not prepared in, in the sense that they don't have the right things or the physician's not prepared and they go back. Actually, it's a big budget crunch because each time they send them out, the military has to pay $242 and then bill TRICARE. So with the patients, when we have already established using the e-consult and when they come out, when the, uh, when the service member comes out of the base and it's all prepared and everything is set up in line for them, they are very, very happy for us, um, with us. Um, so a lot of the anger goes away from that. Uh, but, but I'd like to add, it, it is how, how you would actually position it from, um, uh, from a previous question. Do, are we looking at it as a patient acquisition strategy in terms of, um, and that's, I think you should start from there. You'll get your patient satisfaction. I definitely believe uh, through that you'll get your patient satisfaction. But it could be an acquisition strategy for new patients or on the other end when it's coming into say Epic or something, it's about operational efficiency workflow. And I think from there, um, if you do, concentrate on patient satisfaction, you're going to get those two. It's just how you want to attack that problem. Rich, because I know, Paul, you have a big piece. So, Rich, you first. So, uh, as a primary care clinic organization, my organization, we're on the user side. So, we, we do our own patient experience survey and we do our own employee surveys and we certainly have anecdotal data that suggests that we, our patients love the turnaround time. Our primary care docs, once we got past the implementation, many of them love that, that interaction and, and relationship that they build over time with specialists. Um, I, my understanding is, and there's folks in the room from High Tech LA that's still involved in the, in the program, and I'm, uh, Paul can speak to what the county's plans are. My understanding is there are, in fact, plans to do an evaluation to try to document this in a more valid manner. But anecdotally, yes, it's there, but not across the board. And my understanding is we'll get some real actual data going forward. Yeah, no, I would, I would echo that. Um, we, have, we have been a relatively lean implementation shop, and we're still very much in the implementation phase. We did do some um, patient surveys um, in the first couple months, and those were off the charts positive. It's been over a year since we did our last quantitative analysis of, um, of, of patient experience with this. Um, certainly, anecdotally, you know, um, it's been off the charts. People have just been blown away. Um, uh, but we do have uh, plans to, uh, you know, once we kind of get the bulk of our implementation out, the bulk of our specialties on, the bulk of our users up, uh, really quanti qu quantify um, what we've done. One of our challenges is um, comparing it to a baseline. Um, DHS historically has never been particularly great with, um, you know, data in terms of understanding itself very well. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see what we find, but we may be challenged to have the baseline with which to compare it to. Well, I'll just mention one of the anecdotes that stuck with me that Paul mentioned um, early on when this was launched. You mentioned that patients were uh, communicating back to the central referral unit that DHS had created saying, wait, you're, you're actually calling me and telling me my appointment's a month or two months from now? No one ever calls me. Yeah, yeah. You know, Are, is this the county? Is this the county? <laughs> that's, that's the one I remember. Yeah. So uh, one, 
last question here. Maybe two questions. Come on. John took our time. Right, John? Yeah, so we'll do two questions. Uh, you mentioned the uh, tremendous increase in capacity of delivering specialty care through the program, and one of the factors being uh, that your first appointment was, was much better uh, prepared. Now going to Peter's point of uh, getting 2% on the balance sheet, it would seem like that's taking you quite a ways in that direction. And I was just wondering, it, it's just such an impressive number. Uh, could you just break down a couple of the other ways that this tremendous gain in efficiency is accomplished? Yeah, I'll, I'll share a couple of numbers from the county side. Um, one is um, that on average, 70,000 e-consults, um, two-thirds have ultimately ended up with a face-to-face -face visit. A full one-third never saw the physician face-to-face. -face. That varies widely between our 23 specialties. The medicine specialties, which tend to be a little bit more cognitive, um, have even a different face-to-face -face rate. Some of them are only 40% of them ending up face-to-face, -face, the other 60% being able to be managed remotely. Some of the more procedural specialties have rates of face-to-face -face rates that are like 80 or 85%. Um, even though I define access to specialty care now with e-consult and not the face-to-face -face visit, people all still want to know what our face-to-face -face visits um, have changed. And so if you look at our data from 2011 and you see that a face-to-face -face rate in eight different specialties that I looked at back then was well over 150 days for most of those specialties taken on a mean. Now none of those specialties are over 65 days and some are under 30 days uh, for when they need that face-to-face -face appointment. So I think that's a, that, that's a real um, indication of the impact um, of the program for us. And what's interesting is the 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 environment prior to e-consult and the, the county side where the, the one of the key drivers was access and those are really impressive numbers on the IPA side access wasn't so much of an issue um, but it gets more to the cost question and when you compare the cost not not including the upfront investment in, in the development of the technology but not not including that cost just on a face on a on a per e-consult rate versus a face-to-face -face visit rate it's about a third the cost um, for an e-consult. So to the extent that we can avoid face-to-face -face visits to get the necessary specialty input into the clinical care of the patient, if you can do that in a much faster, much cheaper um, method using e-consult or anything like it, then you're saving money. The, the analysis that I like Paul's term of we've had a fairly lean implementation. Um, and, and the fact, the reality that we are still in the implementation phase is we have not yet, and we, in, 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 in this case, I'm referring to the IPA that my clinic is a member of, um, I'm on the, the task force that's driven the implementation and is trying to drive at some of those questions and answers is we still have not done the analysis to demonstrate the return on investment. We hope that it's there. We believe it will be there. Um, the only number I have on the face-to-face -face visit rates is for DERM. Since we were one of the early adop uh, earlier adopters, I said, at least for us, let's take a pre and post six-month period for dermatology uh, before e-consult and after e-consult where, you know, DERM is perfect for e-consult as, as long as we attach a picture. And not surprised, I mean, actually, quite to my surprise, one of the challenges the IPA is having, I don't know if this is happening on the county side as well, is sometimes this requires partnership and communication. And, you know, we've all been there where the person you're trying to communicate with isn't holding up their end of the bargain. If you ask a dermatologist a question about a rash, you got to attach a photo. And it's really frustrating for the organization and the, the specialist to say, where's the photo? Or even then, sometimes the photo's there, but it's blurry. And I have to admit, I took, I, I took some pictures and I was like, I, it, they were blurry and I had to take them again and again until I got a clear photo. But we were able in the first six months, we reduced our derm face-to-face -face visit rate by 30%. Um, and that, there's a definite cost savings there. I'll just add to that. Uh, I think the financial model that you have to build with all the sensitivities uh, needs to be rigorous when there's a lot of gray area. Um, 
if, if it's preventative care, um, I remember in the early, uh, early when we were starting to roll out, uh, we caught a TB case really early. So how, what does that mean? Um, what was it when we co-manage uh, to prevent a readmission? What does that look like? But I think what even gets more blurry for us at UCLA is uh, getting these complicated patients to really fulfill our teaching mission as well. And so maybe we'll take a hit there in order to make sure our teaching mission is satisfied. So how do we quantify this? I, I think it's a little difficult. I think it's a little easier compared to the teaching mission, uh, a cost avoidance model, and you could put, put some variables in there, but, um, but we're seeing some similar results of decrease face-to-face uh, -face and things like that. All right, I think you got the last question. Okay. How does eConsult make the assignment from uh, the PCP to the um, specialty? Do you, have you seen any competition between the specialty and going after getting those eConsults? Or if you uh, haven't had it, do you anticipate it and how do you make it random or fair that eConsult assigns the different so different models of uh, implementation. I'll have Peter go first, and then I have a specific Paul one for that. Actually, our neurosurgeons, <laughs> really, they're 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 the ones that are really competitive at at UCLA. So when an e consult comes, they all want to go for it, right? So what they had to do was they ha we actually had to take the physicians off. We have actually an outreach coordinator there with all the uh, the, the the assistants to the neurosurgeons. One of the questions for only neurosurgery, they could prefer a physician. So if the with the, with the referring, if they pick, that they settled it. We said, okay, that's how it's going to go. If not de uh, determined by the day that comes in, there's a tree breakdown structure. So um, that's how we did it for neurosurgery. But um, yes, it, it can get competitive depending on the department of division. And it's fascinating how the different business environments and drivers and strategic plans influence the response to the question. Um, in, on the IPA side, and I'll let Paul speak to the, the county side, on the IPA side, one can only wish for the day that there's competition amongst specialists banging down our doors to say, may I please compete to be a specialty reviewer on your e-consult platform and earn a third of what I would earn if, you, if I see that patient in my office. <laughs> So in a fee-for-service billing environment, you know, they have to be a bit forward thinking to understand that they can actually supplement their income if they keep, continue to have an office-based practice where they continue to be paid primarily on a fee-for-service basis, and then in addition can serve as a specialty reviewer, have some interesting interactions and do some teaching and do some good to support primary care providers and the patients they serve. Um, so the, we, we wish for the day that they will be fighting. Um, one of the things we've said all along is that the, the, have no expectation that the specialty reviewer will be the p same clinician that will see your patient if and when a face-to-face -face visit is indicated. And that's taken some time for the specialist to understand. So some referrals to ortho. And the orth orthopedic surgeon located in the far southern reaches of Los Angeles County is doing an e-consult from the far northern reaches and says, sure, I'll see the patient, schedule them. And you know, the education of the specialist is yet another one of the challenges is, well, no, actually. You know, you're geographically not compatible with that patient. Your job is to just provide the answers to the question what the, what's the input specialty wise does this patient need to be seen and if so then a next step which on the IPA side it's one of the few differences in the platform when we submit an e-consult on the IPA side we've actually selected the preferred cons uh, specialist in the event it goes forward to a face-to-face -face visit so the, the specialists have to learn that they're, they're there they're there for the upfront they may not be there on the on the back end yeah. And uh, for, our, for our system, clearly even a, a different dynamic than this, since we actually affiliate every PCP on the system with a individual specialist that they will always get, we tend to do that geographically. And so um, if, uh, uh, you know, Rich is largely within our All of You Medical Center cluster. So the specialist that he gets is usually one of our All of You Medical Center specialists. And so we tend to make those associations geographically. 
So that's it, but in the spirit of collaboration, I just want to mention there's some LA Care folks that continue to support uh, eConsult and the healthcare solutions uh, company, the, the principals are here that uh, collaborated. But uh, I'll point you back at the chart. The chart is a clear indication of the uh, leadership, the innovation, and, and the collaboration that these three folks and many others that are here have done. So please give Paul, Rich, and Peter a hand. And let's give Sajid a great uh, round of applause for a wonderful moderator job. All right, so we're going to break.